Okay. All right, welcome back to day two of the Intro to Fusion course, Intro to Fusion and Plasma course. Um, today we are welcome. It's a bit skewed to the left here. Okay. Um, we are today. We're going to start our introduction to plasma uh, section of the course. Uh, this is going to be. I'm going to predict the most uh, technical part of or going a little bit more into the math of it um, to to get a sense of what are what's the physics of plasma physics and try to go up to waves and turbulence tomorrow. Um, to start us off, uh, we have Dr. Vinicius Duarte. Uh, Vinicius is a staff research physicist here at PBPL. His research is focused on the resonant interactions between fast ions and alphanic modes in tokamaks via analytic and numerical modeling. His current interests include collisional theory, um, kinetic theory, forecast of nonlinear evolution of alph alphenic modes, uh, whole device modeling, quasi-linear transport, wave chirping, galaxy dynamics, and nonlinear partial differential equations. <laughs> He's a member of the ITPA Energetic Particle Physics Topical Group and serves on the editorial board uh, of the Physics of Plasmas and on the executive committee of uh, the Transport Task Force. He obtained his PhD in physics in 2017 from the University of Sao Paulo, for which he received the Brazilian Physical Society Thesis Prize. Congratulations. After a postdoc at PPPL, he moved on to be a research staff here. I, I just asked him what he did for fun. Vinicius works for fun, and when he's tired of that, he works even harder. <laughs> Thank you, Vinicius. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for the hard work that you do here <laughs> in our field, and please take it away. Yeah, you can tell that your your organizer is a is a joker. And so, <laughs> all right, thanks, thank thank you all for for coming and uh, online and, and in person. Uh, I hope you you all have a a pleasant experience here and you you in this beginning of your plasma journey. So, my goal here is to really provide a basic um, um, motivation uh, for why plasmas are important, where they show up, and what are the basic properties of, of plasmas. So part of what I'm going to present today is really to try to prepare, set the ground for what, coming, what comes next. Uh, so I'll be talking about several concepts that will show up in later uh, presentations. OK, so that's the outline of my presentations basically just two parts the first one i'll show where plasmas occur and some uh, where they occur naturally and what can we do uh in terms of technology based on plasmas and i'll talk about the what what makes a plasma a plasma uh, what are the criteria for plasmas and then the second part I'll, I'll mostly focus on a few key concepts that characterize plasmas and which are basically uh, three or four that I'll, I'll be discussing about. So what is a plasma? Uh, plasma is usually uh, referred to as the fourth state of matter. Although this is not incorrect, it's not accurate as well, because that's right. When you, you, you have a solid, you, you heat it, it becomes a liquid, you keep heating, it becomes a gas, if you keep heating your gas, um, what happens is that the particles have so much energy, I mean, the molecules have so much energy that the electrons can just get away from, from the binding atom. And then you start having this soup of, of charged particles, um, positive and negative uh, charges. So why it's not really like a fourth state of matter? Uh, not actually, it's because there's not a, a well-defined phase transition between a gas and a plasma. It it gradually becomes a plasma. There's not a single point like we have between liquid and gas, for example. We know exactly when one becomes the other. So plasma constitutes constitutes over 99% uh, of the known universe. But there's a catch here, right? That we only know a tiny fraction of the universe uh, about 
4.6%. Uh, I think this bar is on the way. Let me try to move it here. Uh, how do I drag it? Maybe here. Yeah, so uh, less than 5% is the ordinary matter. Mo most of it is dark matter and dark energy. So from what we know, plasma is a big fraction of it. Okay, so <clears throat> what does the name plasma mean? Uh, I don't know if Professor Gerakis is in the audience. He's Greek, he can help with, with this. But plasma is, is essentially, it comes from the word, the word, actually you can guess this from Greek by just by looking at the letters like pi, lambda, alpha, sigma. You can guess that it's written like plasma here. And it means <clears throat> a moldable substance. It's something that changes shape very easily. So Langmuir, uh, who was an early uh, pioneer of plasma science and got the <clears throat> chemistry uh, Nobel Prize in 32, he was the one who coined the term plasma. And it means <clears throat> essentially, uh, actually, it, it reminded him of, of, of the blood. So the way the red and the white cells are carried by the blood fluid uh, reminded him of the way ions and electrons flow in this moldable substance as a result of some uh, flow. <clears throat> uh, there are a few definitions of, of plasmas. I'm, I'm showing here a couple that I like. Um, the first one, plasma is in some sense the natural untamed state of matter. So it's much less organized than solid liquids and gases. It has many more degrees of freedom. Another one, a little more accurate, is um, physical systems whose intrinsic properties are governed by collective interactions of large ensembles of free charged particles. So there's a lot there in this definition. So you see that particles need to be charged, they need to be free, there, there needs to be a lot of them to the point that they behave not like single particles, but they behave collectively. Towards the end of the talk, I'll give a more formal definition uh, building on the concepts that I'm gonna uh, uh, develop throughout the talk. So let me show you a few natural occurrences of, of plasmas. Um, one of them is this amazing <clears throat> picture taken by the Hubble telescope. It was actually taken the first time in the mid nineties, but then this is a high resolution version of it 20 years later. Uh, it was, uh, called the pillars of creation. That's because uh, it shows uh, a nebula where uh, in the part of the nebula where stars are born. So those are, uh, just to give you an idea, those are like hundreds of, of light years in, in, in diameter. Uh, what you see in those bright red spots are the stars that are already formed. And here is where they are being formed. Um, so basically, it's a, a gravitational collapse. There is a, a cloud there that um, uh, there's a, a clump of mass. That eventually, they collapse to form uh, stars and planets after that. Another famous uh, natural occurrence in, of, of plasmas now in our planet is the aurora. Uh, is the aurora, aurora australis in the uh, southern hemisphere, the aurora borealis in the northern hemisphere. And those are those beautiful patterns of, of light. And those happen because, I forgot to mention, but let me connect with my title slide here. I didn't explain what this picture was. And this is the, the surface of the sun. And this loop here is called the solar flare. Those are eruptions that naturally happen from time to time in the surface of, of the sun. And that generates the ejection of uh, uh, an enormous amount of particles that constitute the so-called solar wind. And this solar wind eventually hits our atmosphere. And the aurora is a, is a direct consequence of the solar wind. Uh, actually, when those eruptions happen in the sun, you can more or less know when the aurora will show up more prominently. It's typically after two or three days that takes for the solar wind to propagate from the sun to the earth. 
and that uh, disturbance uh, ionizes particles in the atmosphere. There are many different uh, atoms. There are types of atoms that are ionized. So that's why you see different uh, patterns for colors. Another natural occurrence of plasmas in, in galaxies is the matter that surrounds black holes. Those are called accretion disks, and they are um, rotating uh, matter that so basically you have a balance between the centrifugal force due to rotation and the humongous gravitational force of the black hole trying to suck it. And that part is what you can use actually to tell where the black hole is. Uh, and, and because of the very harsh conditions, gravitational conditions surrounding the black holes, uh, that leads to um, to the ionization, heating and ionization of the surrounding gas. So that's why it becomes a plasma. <clears throat> now, so far I talked about uh, natural occurrences of, of plasmas. Let me now move on to technological applications of plasma. So how can we use plasmas in our favor uh, for technology? Um, I'm mentioning here a few applications that I'll uh, I'll show some pictures and schemes later. Uh, those are plasma pencil, which is used in dental treatment and in medicine uh, at large. Uh, plasma torch used in, uh, in uh, metal cutting, for example. Plasma TV, we're all familiar with, although they, they're not as popular as they used to be. <laughs> Fluorescent lamp. Um, and yesterday, uh, Felix Parra mentioned about these plasma thrusters. So they are uh, uh, plasma generators that are used for uh, space travel. And of course, I'll, I'll spend a little time in the uh, holy grail of controlled thermonuclear fusion. So this is what a plasma torch looks like. Uh, so basically you have a cathode and an anode inside here and then it generates a plasma arc so basically a little plasma discharge that works in in room uh, pressure and that generates a very uh, hot uh, beam essentially which is used to cut uh, metal and much more than that it's, it's used even in uh, welding and waste disposal as well uh, the plasma pencil that I mentioned about is essentially a similar, uh, <clears throat> relies on a similar mechanism, but in this case, it's a, a cold plasma. It's a room temperature plasma that is used to, uh, uh, to sterilize and to uh, basically like for more uh, precision uh, remediation. Uh, for uneven surfaces, and so you you don't you don't need to drill uh, uh, in, in some circumstances. Just using this is enough. Uh, all right. So the energy applications. Um, so I won't spend much time on this because this was uh, explored in the lecture yesterday about the introduction to fusion. But let me briefly put this in perspective. Um, so those pictures are from the National Ignition Facility in, in California. What you see here are the beams uh, of the lasers. This is the target in the end here. The target is this uh, capsule called Horam. And you have deuterium tritium there. And then you have an explosion that leads to a, a shock wave that does fusion with that. This is the set of the... I think there are 192 lasers. They are the most powerful lasers in the world. <laughs> and the other uh, mechanism to extract energy from fusion is using uh, magnetic fu uh, fusion. So the the lasers one are essentially it, it relies on a compression of the matter that is inside this capsule. So it's called inertial fusion. Uh, the magnetic fusion is different. So basically, you have a plasma, which uh, you, you, you want it to avoid touching the, the walls of a reactor. 
So in this case, you use uh, magnetic fields to guide the particles. And I'll, I'll show you the basic mechanism for this. This is just a motivation. This is the, the design for, the, for ITER, which is the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, which is the single most expensive experiment ever built by mankind. So it's going to, to cost over uh, 25 billion uh, US dollars. It's being built in Southern France by a consortium of uh, those countries that you see here. Have you visited? I will, not yet. <laughs> uh, later this year. <laughs> I like this plot here that uh, it shows a very interesting uh, property of plasmas is, and that is that they occur within many orders of magnitude. This is not true for solid gases and liquids, but plasmas, you see how many orders of magnitude you have here in temperature and in density. So what is shown here is the different types of, of, of plasmas. Um, flames, you see here, like fire, uh, the aurora that I showed, those are uh, fluorescent uh, lamps, solar wind, the nebula that I showed. Um, the, this is the solar corona, which is at about uh, 5,000 Kelvin of temperature uh, lighting. Now note this interesting feature that the temperature in, inside the magnetic fusion reactor is 10 times larger than the temperature in the center of the sun. So that's about 15 million Kelvin here. And this is about 150 to 200 million Kelvin. Um, and it, the other feature that you can appreciate from this plot is like how dense the iner inertial confinement fusion uh, is with respect to the magnetic one. So the magnetic fusion you expect to do fusion because of the temperature, and this one you expect to do fusion because of compression. Uh, okay, so now let's uh, quantify a little bit and talk more about the concepts that are common to all those plasmas. Um, but before that, uh, let me mention that plasma physics is not, um, it's not like quantum mechanics that you have like one standard book that you can just read it and that's it. Like you don't have a lot more going on. Plasma physics involves, uh, it, it's basically at the interface of many disciplines, uh, most notably, oops, electrodynamics, fluid mechanics, statistical physics, thermodynamics. For a certain class of plasmas, more dense plasmas, also quantum mechanics is important. And before I go to the uh, to our key concepts, you're going to see that I'm not going to mention about the gravitational force, and that's because oh, that's because um, if you compare the gravitational force to the electric force uh, for uh, small particles, essentially the electric force dominates by many orders of magnitude. So gravity will not be too important for what we're gonna be talking here, but it is relevant for many applications like the, the plasma around the black hole, for example. Okay, so the first concept that is key for us is the Debye length. Um, and to understand this, <clears throat> picture this, uh, you have a plasma in a container so you have this pink container and you have this soup of charged particles, positive and negative. So they are free. That's one of the properties that they're not uh, bound to an atom or a lattice, uh, they're free. So now what happens if you place a test charge? So you, you take a, a charge from outside of the container and place it there. I'm just arbitrarily choosing it to be positive, but it could be negative. The principle is the same. Uh, when you place it there, what happens is around that charge, which I chose to be positive, what's gonna happen is many negative charges are going to accumulate around it because uh, it will attract the other charge. Um, 
Now, the key, the key question that the Dubai con uh, length concept addresses is, what is the radius of the sphere of influence for this extra charge? How far away do you have to be for the extra charge to be completely uh, shielded by the plasma? So if I'm sitting here, for example, in this position, am I going to feel this external charge or is it going to be totally screened by the negative charges that moved around it? And to understand this, uh, we use the Poisson equation to calculate the potential, the electrostatic potential due to rho, which is the excess charge uh, in that region. So basically that excess charge is a combination of a delta function, which is the, the test particle that we put here. So this one here, plus uh, the disturbance of the plasma charges that happen there. So I'm considering just for simplicity that uh, the combination from the ions is not, uh, the contribution from the ions is, is not changing because of the test particles. They take longer to respond and they're not really disturbed by it. So mostly the electrons are uh, responding to this external charge. And it's a common practice to consider a um, so-called Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution for electrons that happens in thermal equilibrium. So basically the, uh, the density of electrons is some constant background density uh, with an exponential term with, with uh, an electrostatic potential divided by temperature. So basically you plug this into here for the disturbance of, of the electron density and you get essentially this. It is also a common practice that is satisfied in, by most plasmas that the electrostatic potential energy is usually much less than the thermal energy. And with this, you can linearize this exponential term. So exponential of x is approximately one plus x. So that's what is happening here. You linearize that exponential term. And the resulting expression is this essentially, that the Laplacian, or which involves a second derivative of the potential, a linear term in the potential equals a delta function. And your end result, is this, that the potential <clears throat> as a function of the radius centralized at the, at the test charge, which is this one again. So the radius we're measuring from the center of this charge towards the outside. So we want to understand how the potential of this charge is being modified by the surrounding plasma charges. And the answer is basically this, that the potential uh, decays exponentially with a characteristic uh, length that we choose to define as the Debye length given by this expression. So that's the characteristic shielding length of a plasma. Whenever you place a charge in a plasma, it's gonna be shielded. And if you will ask the question, uh, to what extent can you feel the, the potential of that external charge? The answer is basically this. It's within a Debye length. Uh, that's the characteristic <clears throat> uh, screening uh, of the potential. So you see that the Debye length is related to uh, other quantities of the plasma, such as density, charge, and temperature. So the more charge, uh, the the less the Debye length will be, which makes sense because if you have many more charges, the, the plasma is gonna be more effective at shielding the potential. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you have more temperature, plasma, uh, the particles vibrate more, they are not so easily accommodated around the charge and it takes a uh, longer Debye length. So it's interesting to compare how the, the Debye potential given by this expression compares with the usual vacuum one over our potential. And the takeaway is that uh, it decays faster. So if you compare uh, the, the screening in a plasma to what happens in vacuum, you see that because the plasma has 
uh, charges that are shielding that test uh, charge, then the potential drops uh, uh, faster than than it would in, in vacuum. Uh, I think it's uh, quite uh, illustrative to to see at typical time scale, uh, sorry, typical Debye length scales in different systems. That also uh, illustrates the fact that plasmas occur in a very wide uh, parameter range. In the solar core, those are extremely small uh, Debye length. In a tokamak, it's still very small, uh, a tenth of a millimeter. But in the, in, in the galactic medium, it has a, a, a totally different scale of hundreds of kilometers. Okay, so the second concept will be related to uh, how plasmas oscillate. Remember that one of the uh, definitions of plasma is that it has free charges and it responds collectively to applied uh, fields and internal fields as well. So to see this in the simplest setting, consider this um, container of, of a plasma here that has positive and negative charges. And what we're gonna do to this container is to displace a little bit the negative charges to one side and some positive charges to the other side. It's just a, a disturbance. You have like a, a plasma at rest, you, you basically introduce a disturbance uh, because of the difference in mass. One will go to one side, the other to the other side. Now, what happens from there? That's the key uh, concept we want to explore here. Once you have this disturbed state, how does the plasma respond and how fast does it take for the plasma to respond to, to this disturbance? Okay, so because of the disturbance, we have an, an electric field shown in pink here. Uh, pointing from the positive to the negative charges. And we're going to use uh, Gauss law to find that electric field. And with that, we're going to calculate the frequency of oscillation between the, the two charges. So physically, before doing any calculations, if you look at this, what you would expect is that because of this electric field, uh, positive charges will be brought to the right, negative charges will be brought to the left. But then when that happens, they invert. And then you have an electric field pointing on the opposite direction to the left. And then what happens is that they invert again and they keep inverting at a characteristic frequency, which is the plasma frequency. So there is always an overshoot. It's like a harmonic oscillator and it will become more evident uh, in the calculation. So we're going to use two equations. Uh, the Gauss law to find the electric field, and we're going to apply Newton's second law to find the, the motion of the particles that are subject to this electric field. Okay, so this is Gauss law, uh, the uh, electric field uh, crossing some area element, and this is the enclosed uh, charge due to this disturbance. So, if you look here, we have L, we have Z, and we have delta X. Those are the, the geometric parameters of our problem. And the, the charge is basically uh, the density, the, the charge density uh, times the volume, the enclosed volume by that area. So with that, we can calculate the electric field in terms of density and in terms of delta X, the the the, the size of that disturbance. Now we're gonna use the other equation, Newton's second law to calculate what happens to, uh, to a particle that is subject to that electric field. So basically this is the delta X of a, you can think of as the delta X for a given particle that is oscillating back and forth as a result of that electric field that is also uh, changing as a result of a changing delta X. It's a coupled problem, right? The electric field depends on the amount of disturbance and the amount of disturbance depends on the electric field. So this 
uh, Newton's second law is naturally cast uh, in the form of a, of a Hooke's law, which is basically the equation for the harmonic oscillator. This is because the electric field is linearly proportional to this delta x. So basically you have this equation, uh, the second derivative of, of x uh, equals a constant times x, which is the harmonic oscillator uh, equation. And then whatever this coefficient is, is the frequency of, of oscillation of that system. So all particles that are uh, subject to this electric field here are going to oscillate at this frequency. So the larger, the denser or the charge, the faster the oscillation is, which makes sense because uh, if you have uh, more charge, then they respond more easily to the electric field. They, they, they respond more vigorously and it's inversely proportional to mass. So if you have particles oscillating here with a large mass, it takes longer for them to, to uh, overcome the inertia and, and the inertia and start oscillating. Okay, so we discussed two key concepts of the characteristic length of plasmas called the Debye length and the characteristic frequency of plasmas, uh, the plasma oscillation. Uh, now I'm going to talk about uh, gyro frequency, which is intended to uh, motivate for the second talk. So if we ask the question of how can we use a plasma in a lab, for that we need to confine a plasma. But usually plasmas are very hot, so they're gonna melt the wall of, of whatever container you use. So that's what would happen if you just let a plasma inside a, a container. We don't want that to happen. We want to engineer clever ways to avoid making the avoid letting the plasma make contact with the surface of the container. One simple way of doing that is using uh, magnetic fields. So I'm going to put a magnetic field pointing to the right here. And what happens now to the particles, to the plasma that is inside this container? So if we look at one individual particle uh, around the magnetic field, it's going to do helical trajectories around the magnetic field. And next slide, I'll show the equation for this. But along a magnetic field, there's no work being done. So that's what the Lorentz force tell us. So what happens to the plasma is this. It starts encircling the magnetic field, but wait, we still have a problem here because we avoided con contact up and down here, but they're still making contact with the surface at the left and right ends. Before talking about the solution for that, let me just show the uh, the simple expression for that cyclotron frequency, which is this frequency of, of gyration around the magnetic field. So the cyclotron frequency is the time, is, is two pi over the time it takes for a particle to do one circle around the magnetic field. So essentially from Newton's second law again, we have a Lorentz force being balanced by a um, centripetal force. And essentially you, you can get with minimal manipulations, this uh, cyclotron frequency, which is uh, charge times the magnetic field divided by the mass. So I, I pose this problem of, okay, now we solved part of it, which is uh, not touching up and down, but still touching here. What is the natural solution for for making a good container for a plasma is to bend that cylinder in a torus. So basically, like if you cut here and stretch, it becomes a cylinder, right? We're connecting the two ends of the cylinder to avoid those end losses. So the torus is the simplest configuration for our, a plasma confinement. There's actually a mathematical theorem for that. It's called the hairy ball theorem. Uh, basically like imagine you have a ball with hair you can never comb the hair on the surface of the ball without leaving uh, like sources and sinks essentially like you. Um, 
So hurricanes of hair, yeah. <laughs> Just look at Arturo's hair here. You're gonna have a picture. Okay, so that's our solution that we want the particle to spiral along the magnetic field. However, it's more complicated than that. And this is a motivation for the next talk by Priya Sinha. Particles in a real torus not only spiral around the magnetic field, they also drift away from the magnetic field. And that's a problem that you talk at length about it and how to, to solve that. The solution of that, just, just a little spoiler, is to uh, consider a torus in which the magnetic fields are not only circular like this, but they are helical. Uh, and that's a result of the uh, so-called toroidal field, which is a lo the long way around the torus, and a poloidal field, which is the short way along the torus. The combination of both will give this helical field uh, with, with the so-called magnetic uh, surfaces. So particles will basically, as they drift, they don't go away from a magnetic surface. That's the key concept that those two guys came up with. Um, they came up with the, the tokamak concept, uh, Igor Tam and Andrei Saharov. They're both Nobel Prize winners, but not because of tokamak. Uh, Igor Tam described the so-called Cherenkov uh, effect. And Saharov actually got a, a Nobel Prize, a Peace Nobel Prize, uh, because of his activism for the non proliferation of, of uh, nuclear facilities. So the tokamak that I'm just showing a simple cartoon here is essentially this. It, it, it builds on those concepts. So in pink, you see the, the plasma. And those uh, uh, Helical trajectories is what we would like the particles to follow. And what is shown on the outside is essentially the coils that are needed to produce those, those fields. So you, you're going to learn more about this uh, in the rest of the course. So basically you have a transformer to generate the, the toroidal field and the poloidal field, uh, which is the long, the short way is produced by the plasma current that is shown here. Yeah, tokamak means uh, it's an acronym for the Russian uh, toroidal chamber with magnetic coils. But the tokamak is not the not the only. It's for, for sure the one that has received the most uh, funding historically, but it's not the only uh, viable option for nuclear fusion. Um, what is shown here is in perspective, like what a tokamak looks like in comparison to a stellarator. So a tokamak has a and asymmetry, like essentially if you make a cut here, 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 or there, it looks like the same. It has the symmetry along this toroidal direction here. A stellarator uh, engine, it, it uses another way of, of uh, canceling the drifts. And it's not because of plasma current, but because of external coils, that, that's what it looks like. There are alternative concepts like the reverse field pinch that reverses uh, field uh, in different magnetic surfaces and field reverse configurations that the plasma spins in the middle of. Uh, what goes down the middle of the field. Yeah, so let let me go back here. So in the middle of the tokamak, there's a a trans a solenoid essentially. So basically, uh, the plasma is the secondary of a transformer. Uh, you have uh, some current running through here and that like if you use the right hand rule you're going to see that there will be a current associated with no monotonic changes of of the uh, magnetic field in the current here as well uh, so the accelerator although it, it looks more complicated than it is definitely more complicated to simplify to, to manufacture this type of coil but it offers this simplicity that you don't need a plasma current to uh, guide, to, to generate a field that guides the particles. Okay, my last uh, uh, topic here is just a brief slide that I think is worth mentioning, not because I work on a related topic, but because that's the only Nobel Prize that was won for plasma work. And it was uh, 
born by Hannes Alfin, he, he was Swedish. Um, he was the, an early proponent of uh, the so-called magnetohydrodynamics. And although this name looks complicated, it's simply the combination of fluid dynamics and electromagnetism. So those were before him largely thought to be independent uh, fields that the combination of them would not lead to anything uh, fundamentally different or uh, observable. And he was an early, he was an engineer, he was not a physicist. And he, uh, he was, he had this physical picture in his mind. Imagine that you have a magnetic field, uh, a plasma embedded in a magnetic field, B naught here. And then what happens if you displace the plasma, like a fluid element of the plasma and, and see what, what, it, what happens. So basically it's an analog of what we did for the plasma frequency, but in a region of a, of a magnetic field. And what happens is that, I won't have time to describe in detail, but you displace some of the plasma element because of the Lorentz force and, uh, and coupled with fluid equations, it restores that oscillation, but not only the fluid uh, uh, part and the fluid element is displaced, but also the magnetic field uh, has a perturbation that is displaced as well, as you see here. This is a very similar uh, physical mechanism as the string of a guitar. If you think of the magnetic field as a string of a guitar, and you have different tones depending on the size of that, uh, this is, a, a very similar mechanism. Um, it's interesting that you see that the time between when he proposed in 42 and the time that he got the Nobel Prize there were 28 years. Like people took a long time to appreciate uh, what, what he did. Uh, in modern tokamaks and stellarators, those often waves can lead to very serious uh, plasma instabilities, uh, which need to be addressed. And another application of those uh, often waves is, is regarding an, uh, an open problem in, in, of, of solar physics, and namely the heating of the solar corona. And that's an interesting and uh, still open problem that if you look at the surface of the sun, it has a given temperature. And then as you go away from the sun and you hit this, uh, region called the corona, it's hotter than the surface of the sun. So you have the core of the sun very hot. It, it gets cool as you go away to the surface. And then it doesn't get cooler as you, go, as you keep going away to the corona. It gets hotter. And that's apparently like a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. Of course, it's not, but there's something going on. And often waves are an exp uh, a possible explanation for this, like you have waves being emitted and being absorbed in the corona. So that's, that's one heating mechanism that has been proposed. Another curiosity about this uh, Nobel Prize is that this is the Nobel Prize that has been awarded uh, to the shortest paper, uh, the, like the shortest Nobel Prize paper. So this paper here is one column, it's half a page only. Yeah. Okay, so that's basically all I wanted to, to, all the concepts I wanted to develop with you. Now, let's bring it all together to try to give a more formal definition of what a plasma is. So in the beginning, I just mentioned some words for what definitions are. But before getting to the formal definition, let's just do a recap that plasma is a conducting medium with many degrees of freedom. It shields electric field and it supports a variety of waves. It supports vacuum waves like light waves, waves that do not need a medium to propagate. They support gas waves like sound waves that rely on compression and rarefaction of, of fluid elements. And they support many other waves uh, associated to electromagnetic coupling with fluid equations. Yeah, by the way, that's what the root of this word means, like magneto 
for, means the electromagnetism part, and hydro is the fluid part. Of, so it's the coupling between electromagnetism and fluid. So here's the uh, more formal definition of what makes a plasma. Uh, I took this from a book that I'll refer to in the end uh, by Francis Chen. It's a great undergraduate book. Um, first, the Debye length needs to be much smaller than the system characteristic length. So basically you need to shield charges uh, within uh, reduced uh, uh, distances compared to the whole distance of your plasma, the whole uh, size of your plasma. Second, the number of particles in a Debye sphere, so basically the particles that dress the test particles, they need to be much larger than one. You, in a plasma, you're rarely looking at individual particles. You don't need to, uh, well, sometimes you do, but for most applications, it's enough to look at as a, as a, a fluid of, of particles. And third, that the plasma oscillation period is much less than the collision time. And that's because one of the definitions of plasma is that it needs to exhibit collective behavior. If you have too much collision going on, you won't see the plasma oscillations that characterize them. So basically you need those oscillations to be uh, measurable. Uh, otherwise you just have a guess. So plasmas are physical systems whose intrinsic properties are governed by those collective interactions of large ensembles of free charged particles. Uh, takeaways. Uh, so we saw that plasmas happen uh, within many systems in astro solar, uh, technological devices, nuclear fusion, which can be either inertial or magnetic. And we built on those two concepts that the the basic scale for, for, for the plasma time and oscillation is the plasma frequency. And the basic uh, parameter for the distance in a plasma is the Debye shielding. And I recommend those two reads here. Uh, the first is a, is a great undergraduate level book um, by Francis Chain. The second one, which I used a lot, uh, is something in between undergrad and, and, and graduate level. Uh, what I love about this book by Bittencourt is that uh, he opens up all the calculations so you, you can self-teach uh, uh, with, with this book. So with that, I end and I welcome questions. Thank you. Yes, round of applause for the speaker. Thanks. Um, so can somebody help me out today again for can i do it again yep so if we have any questions on here please raise your hand and online please raise your hand too we'll start with an online question by tanya tanya can you unmute please yeah i have a question so um uh, about the alpha ways a little confused. So why are they like, why is the displacement happening in the first place? Like the displacement of the fluids of the plasma? Yeah, so that can happen as a, uh, from a variety of reasons. So plasmas are intrinsically, um, they're never at rest. So you always have some perturbation leading, like kickstarting those oscillations. So it can come from a thermal noise, for example, it can come from a perturbing source, it can come from waves, other waves that are propagating the plasma, it can come from clumping of particles in, in the plasma. So there's really a lot that can happen, uh, can, can kickstart those oscillations. And, and um, they are natural modes of oscillation of, of the plasma. You don't need a lot of initial perturbation. So the modes, it, are always there. They're natural modes of the system. So uh, the, the question is, are those oscillations going to increase in amplitude or not? Okay, so is it like always happening then? So those, it, whenever you have a plasma embedded in a magnetic field, those waves are there always. Okay. Yeah. Great, thank you. 
Yeah, I, I like to compare it to like in the ocean or in water. You're always gonna have waves mm -hmm. because of different things that happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, um, Ashu. Can you, oh, I'm sorry, hold on. Sorry, Ashu, can you unmute? Yes, yeah. uh, can you hear me? Yes, faintly. Can you speak up, okay. please? Okay, uh, hello? Yes, we can hear yeah, you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, people say like uh, instead of uh, investing billions of dollars, you said like 25 billions uh, in fusion technology. That is uh, That can be called as a great gamble. And that can be like invested in other sources of renewable energy. So what is your opinion about that? Uh, so the invest the investment looks massive, uh, mm -hmm. but it, in fact it's not because like just it, it, the twenty five billion dollars I mentioned it's over many years of experiment it's not per year, and compared to to the potential benefit that this technology can bring, uh, it's really nothing actually. Even though okay, like uh, like we can use that money in uh, developing better solar panels or something or windmills. Yeah, that sure. has already I, proved right. So sure, you you need to like investing in thermonuclear fusion doesn't mean that you need to stop investing in other technologies. Um, solar and uh, wind, they're great, they're clean, but they are intermittent and they will not likely be able to uh, to contribute a substantial fraction of the energy that the humankind needs. So uh, fusion is a great investment. Thank you. Uh, any questions in here? Yes. Uh, sorry, just, just go to, yeah, give us a minute. Um, when you're talking about like the, the gyro frequencies, you mentioned that in, uh, like when you're moving around like the uh, Tacomic, uh, you have to have like twisted magnetic fields. Oh. I had read through a little bit of Chen's book already and they mentioned that in a uniform magnetic field, you don't get any of that drifting. But when you apply like a little bit of uh, a uniform electric field, it looks like you got some like drift velocities. Mm -hmm. um, how does that apply to here and why do we need these twisted magnetic fields? Yeah, okay. So I think your question will probably be answered uh, in the, in the, okay. by the next speaker, but I can give you uh, some a high level answer. So the way you produce the magnetic fields that confine the plasma, they are intrinsically non-uniform. So to, because you have a transformer running here, basically the magnetic the, the magnetic field in the toroidal direction will have an one over radius dependence. So it's intrinsically uh, non-uniform, but there are other drifts as well associated with uh, gradient scene density. So there's a lot. There's uh, uh, drifts associated with the cross product between electric field and magnetic field. So you're right, uh, magnetic field non-uniformities non are a big component of it, but th they're not all. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. We have an attendee question. Uh, Felipe Salvador, you should be able to unmute yourself. Felipe? Okay. While you unmute yourself, we're going to go with Crystal Scott. Can you unmute yourself? Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. So my question actually had to do when you were talking about the plasma shield, because I'm kind of, I'm an undergrad, so we're kind of covering this now. When the shield is created and it deflects the, the electrons that are incoming, what actually happens to those electrons that are not being um, confined or shielded? So I didn't hear the beginning. You're talking about the Dubai shielding, right? Yes. Yeah, so is your question about what happens to those electrons here surrounding the red charge? So I know when you're doing the Dubai shielding, there are certain electrons that get deflected. Those electrons, what happens to those that have gotten deflected? Yeah, so... Um, Deflections are happening all the time, essentially, in a plasma, and they are uh, like called Rutherford uh, scattering. So that's happening uh, to all particles, but 
this cartoon is an oversimplification uh, of what we want to show. In fact, like, all particles are moving, but on average, there is a net uh, negative amount of charge surrounding this test particle. So it's not a static uh, uh, process, but on average, you have this shielding. But okay, the flexions are happening all the time. This is a very okay. unsteady environment. Thank you. So does that answer? Oh, okay. Uh, Felipe, Felipe, can you unmute? Are you still unable to? Okay. Uh, we're going to let another attendee, um, Aun uh, Niranjana, can you please unmute? Uh, we're still having yes. some issues. Yes. Oh, there, yes. Aun, you can. Yep. So I have a, a question in slide number 24, perhaps. If I'm not wrong. Can you speak up, please? Uh, I have a question at the slide number 24, perhaps, if I remember correctly. 24. 34 or? 24. 24. 20, 20. Okay, I'll go back. Uh-huh. Yeah, go on. What is your question? It's the outline. So, two, four, or three, four? Uh, it was, uh, I'm, I'm sorry for, for, for my poor memory. It was 20. Okay. okay, can you ask your question? No, it's not the right slide. Um, unfortunately, it's really hard to hear you. Can you, can you just uh, put your question in the Q&A and we'll try to get to it? Um, yeah, I think there's, there's, it's breaking up. So if I see the slide, I can remember exactly. I, sorry for my... Well, it's okay. Maybe. It's okay. Just put it in the Q&A. Okay, let me try that. Yeah. All right. Uh, here, there was a question over here. Yep. Uh, yeah, so mine was on slide 15. There's a little diagram that talks about like, uh, like this is outside the realm of classical plasmas. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about like what, what is like a classical versus non-classical plasma? Like what is, like what would a non-classical plasma, like I- It would be a quantum plasma. Okay. Yeah. So, like, so sorry. Yeah, yeah. So there are quantum plasmas. There are uh, relativistic plasmas as well. Um, and the quantum, like, of course, in a plasma, um, you have the quantum properties there. But I didn't mention anything today because they're not essential for the global properties of the plasma that we want to look at. Of course, like in a, uh, in a small time scale, the, the quantum world is there. But um, they usually show up, like those quantum, uh, quantum properties of plasmas, they usually show up when the plasmas are denser. So uh, in, in a normal plasma, it's so rarefied that like the quantum influence of one part over the other uh, has decayed within the, uh, the wave function, which is like much less than the distance, typical distance between particles. Uh, but as you bring those particles together, then they, quantum mechanically uh, interact with one another. Um, and also in, in fusion, uh, of course, like the fusion uh, that we want to make in the lab is when particles have so much energy that they are able to overcome the uh, electrostatic repulsion and get close enough so that the wave functions can overlap and lead to fusion. But that, um, that physics is known. So we're not reinventing that, we're just like, trying to develop a plasma that would uh, work for that end. Okay, well, we're gonna try to get the last, we're gonna try to get, um, yeah, but they'll, they'll be around, they can be. Okay. I wanna get some of the attendees because we're gonna, you're gonna be able to go to the hallway discussion. Yeah, yeah, right? I'll be here. Yeah. So the, since the attendees won't have the link, I wanna give them a chance to ask their questions. All right, uh, Felipe, last chance, Felipe. Can you unmute? Okay, we're, you seem to be having difficulties there. So I'm gonna give it to Dr. Pawan uh, Kumar. Can you, can you unmute? 
Dr. Kumar. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. I am audible. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for many for for a wonderful lecture. My question is that what is the effect of twisting magnetic field for confinement? Because in the in tokamak, the magnetic field lines is not twisted, but in the stellator, the magnetic field lines are twisting. So what is the uh, in which case the confinement is more uh, in tokamak or in case of tokamak, tokamak field lines or in case of twisting magnetic field lines? So you're talking like we, in which case the confinement is better? Yeah, yes, 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 absolutely right. Yeah, so that's a, that's a very complicated question that- uh, A actually, billion dollar question. Yeah, it's, <laughs> uh, uh, the thing, uh, Kumar, is that uh, the way they are designed, uh, they are both highly efficient. Let me show here the, yeah, tokamaks and stellarius are, if the plasma behaved ideally, uh, they would be both fantastic ways of confining plasmas. And they are good ways to, conf to confine a plasma. But the problem is that there is much more than the simplified picture that we address uh, here this afternoon. Uh, for example, there is turbulence in the plasma and you guys are going to have a whole class on, on, on turbulence. That's one mechanism that expels a lot of plasmas, a, a lot of particles from the plasma. The other uh, problem is uh, plasma instabilities. I mentioned about those Alfin waves and there is a whole class of waves that as they grow in the plasma, they start expelling particles away from the plasma. So those are called the anomalous uh, losses. So there are losses that are not generated by the magnetic field that uh, makes the, the plasma, but by external uh, means. So that's the big problem. Okay. All right. Well, I think it's 101. This uh, marks the end. Uh, so uh, Vinicius, you'll be able to join the hallway yeah, discussion. Uh -huh. So we'll we'll let him join. But um, so before we close, let's give our speaker a round of applause. Okay, for the enrollees, I've put the hallway discussion in the in the chat. Please, you're welcome to join. And uh, so you can either go home or you can be. Home. I'll be here. Yeah. Okay. Should I keep the, my microphone? Uh, no, I think that's the whole door that they call me. <laughs> um, yeah, just, just let me change the video. Sorry about that. I should have just given you a heads up on the video. Okay. Thank you for discussion, but, um, I did want to ask a few questions. Do I still have to? Can I ask why? Give me a, give me a second. So, uh, uh, so.